Well, we are in our series called Disciple, and our mission statement here is to love God, love people, make disciples. So we want to have a, a good understanding of what it is to be a disciple. Uh, I was challenged uh, this past week. I don't know if you saw in the news, it was in last week's news, uh, but there is a documentary uh, that's coming out on the underground church in Iran. And the movement is called the Iranian Awakening. And I was reading the article and it said, Muslim background Iranians are leading a quiet but mass exodus out of Islam and bowing their knees to the Jewish Messiah. And it said, a leader of the Iranian underground church explains their goal is not planting churches, but rather making disciples, the majority of whom are women. And I thought this is just really interesting how God is moving in a country where the gospel is outlawed and forbidden. This Iranian leader goes on to say, and I want to put this up on the screen because they're talking about, they have a passion to make disciples, and I found that's what was challenging. They said, disciples forsake the world and cling to, G to, Jesus, he, till he, clings to Jesus till he comes. Converts don't. Disciples aren't engaged in a cultural war. Converts are. Disciples cherish, obey, and share the word of God. Converts don't. Disciples choose Jesus over anything and everything else. Converts don't. Converts run when the fire comes. Disciples don't. And this, this article just caught my attention. The words of this underground church leader just kind of drew me in because they're talking about this difference between disciples and converts. And so I was like, well, I want to have a, a better understanding of this. And so understand that, that when it comes to being a convert, all of us start out as converts. Okay, a convert is a new believer. And so, but what happens is so many times is people stop when they get to the point of converting. They just stop their growth. They make Christianity all about what they believe and not as much how they live. And so converts aren't, aren't necessarily wrong or bad converts. Think of a convert as a babe in Christ. So we all start out there, right? We all start there. And there's nothing wrong with babies, right? Uh, I've got a granddaughter who's eight months old. And you know what? She acts like an eight-month-old granddaughter. So, and that's cute, right? Now, 30 years from now, she's acting the same way and still in diapers. We're going to have a conversation, <laughs> right? There is an expected maturity. And this is what they're talking about. I was thinking of the scripture in Corinthians where Paul says, When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. And, and it just struck me how you have to understand over in Iran where the gospel is outlawed, uh, these believers absolutely desperately need Jesus. He's not a convenience button to them. He's life and death. And they make a hard line distinction between converts and disciples. To them, a convert is someone who just comes and kind of cheers for Jesus on the sidelines. It's the disciples who are on that field and engaged and involved and plugged in. It's the disciple, not the convert, who is so intentional about pursuing godliness and growing in godliness. It's that disciple that, you know what, at their very core is their belief in Jesus, is their belief in Christ. And because of that solid core belief, it overflows into how they live life, how they think, how they talk. It affects every area of their life. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we, we, when we were looking at being a disciple, and we talked about how we're called to be salt and light, and, and just that... 
uh, imagery that Jesus used for us. It's to, it, the presence of God in our life should overflow in a way and to a degree that it is obvious and noticeable to those around us. came across this quote, and uh, it's uh, from Madeline Lingle. And uh, I did not know her. She's a Christian writer. So I asked my daughter, who's a writer, and she, and she knew her. And so that was good. And I was like, well, I just like what she said here. Uh, she says, we draw people to Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. See, church, we're called to be that. That's what a disciple is called to. That, that very command Jesus gave us where he said, go and make disciples. The, the literal translation is as you go, as you are going through life, as you do life. Right? It's not necessarily the command that, okay, he's calling you to go overseas. And if he does, that's great. But he's saying for us here in Winchester, in a small rural community, what he's saying to us is as you live life, as you do life, you go and you be that salt and that light. Church, he calls us to great things as his disciples. Today we're going to talk about uh, serving as disciples. But this this is this will go different in terms of serving than maybe what you might imagine. I'm you know, usually if a pastor's going to talk about serving, he's going to come out here and I'm going to lay down the the 20 80% rule that happens in churches all over. 20% do 100% of the work. And you burn 20% of your church out, right? Enough said. I want to back up and I want to talk about serving, but there's deeper heart issues for us as disciples that we have to go to in talking about serving before we ever get about being a part of the body and how we love and walk along with each other. So I want to address the question today of this. When it comes to serving, here's the question. Who do you serve? Okay. It might seem like a very straightforward, simple answer, and we're going to dig into this. Who do you serve? And so I want you to take your Bibles, and we're going to go to Romans 6. Because Paul is going to address this very question for us when it comes to serving. Uh, if you need a Bible, look under the seat in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, then take that one. We want you to have it. So let me tell you what's going on here. And Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, Paul is basically at this point in his letter, he's addressing some accusations that are made or have been made against his preaching. Uh, namely that they had a problem with the gospel that Paul was preaching. So what's the gospel that Paul is preaching? Let me lay it out for you so you understand. Here's the gospel that Paul was preaching that in Christ... All of our sins, past, present, and future, have been forgiven. Okay? They've been fully and freely forgiven through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That <clears throat> what God did was imputed Christ's righteousness to you. You and I are unrighteous. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. And he says... Christ, or God imputed Christ's righteousness, his rightness before God, he gave to you. And he did that on the cross. It was on the cross that Christ took upon himself the wrath that was due us. The wrath due to our sin. And so that when anyone puts their faith and trust in that work that Christ did on the cross then that leads to eternal life rather than eternal death. So that's the kind of the gospel in a nutshell. That's what Paul was preaching. We all on the same track? So here was the problem. The problem was is that many of the people that day, many of the leaders, wrestled with this whole idea and understanding of grace. That as believers, you are free 
and no longer under the law. They're like, how could you do that? Paul, if you go around and tell people that they are no, no longer under the law, then basically what you're telling them is, you know what? I can go out and sin any way I want, and God will forgive me. And they're like, Paul, don't you understand? Holiness is so important to God. So how could you tell people this? And so what they saw when they heard the gospel Basically, they saw that it was something that would lead to licentiousness or promiscuity, that people could just be like, well, hey, if God forgives me, then what's the big deal? And Paul is Paul's just like, no, 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 no. Let me address this. Let me address this. So look at verse 15. Look at verse 15. Paul says this. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law? But under grace? By no means. Okay, listen, there was this, there was this assumption, and it was, it was pretty ridiculous that people made, and here's how it went. The more I sin, the more of a favor I'm doing to God. Because I'm giving Him a bigger opportunity to show grace and to show forgiveness. So by me going out and sinning, God, I'm actually doing you a favor because you get to show how great, and how merciful, how compassionate you are. That was the thought. And so what Paul's going to address here is that, you know, any attitude, any attitude like that, anything in our lives that welcomes sin, Anything in our life that rationalizes sin or excuses sin, he's going to say this has nothing to do with grace. It has everything with you still being enslaved to sin itself. That's what he's going to point out here. Look at verse 16. He says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? So he's saying you become a slave to whatever you obey. All right? So the question is not, are you a slave or are you a servant? The question is, who... Are you serving? That's what he's going to lay out. This, this uh, word up here for slaves uh, in the Greek is doulos. And basically that means slave or servant. Okay? That you belong, you belong to someone. And <laughs> you don't get to vote on it or anything. You belong to someone and you don't get to choose whether you're a servant you are. That's how God created us. The question comes down to is, who are you serving? And so what Paul lays out here in Scripture is basically two options. There's two options. You can serve sin, that's ultimately going to lead to death, or you can serve obedient, obedience, which ultimately leads to righteousness, sanctification, and eternal life. And that's it. That's the choice you have. So the question comes back to us then, who then is our master? Who is it that we serve? And that's the question we have to get to the bottom of. So what does it look like for sin to be our master? Now Jesus laid this out, I thought, in pretty straightforward terms in John 8.34. It says, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Okay? Everyone who practices. Now, some of your versions uh, in your Bibles, that verse may read, everyone who commits sin. Uh, this word commit can also be translated practice. I, I like that translation, actually, because I, I, Paul says we all stumble in many ways. So all of us sin. Okay? This is someone who practices. It's not like you live mostly an upright life and you stumble once in a while. This is talk about 
a practice of sin, that there is this habit of sin. There's a rhythm in your life. There is a repetition of it. And Jesus is saying, if that's the case, then that individual is a slave to sin. And that's how Jesus defines it. Paul, when he uses this word slave, he's using it He's using in this context, and if you look down, you'll see he even says this in verse 19 there in in Romans 6, where he's like, I'm I'm using this imagery of slave and master because it was one in their culture that they would get. They would understand that as slaves or servants, they are ruled absolutely by their master. Their will is whatever the will of their master is. So whatever the master says is to be done, that's what's done in the discussion. You have no comment or editorial voice in the matter. Now, Paul's going to later tell us that, that, it's, that you and I are dead in our trespasses and sin. So to, be, to practice sin, then, is to be enslaved to death. And here's the thing. Without Christ, you and I are stuck in death. You get that? Without Christ, we're stuck in death. We have no free will of our own. Our will is actually serving our master, which is sin. We're stuck there, right? And so Paul then begins to explain how this is lived out, how this begins to to show up in a life. Look at verse 19. He says, For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So lawlessness leads to more lawlessness. When sin gets in our life and sin is not dealt with, it grows. This sin leads to another sin, which leads to another sin, and each time it becomes more and more expansive. Jesus compared that to uh, yeast. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys can tell, but I do like to cook and eat what I cook. All right? So I, I love the Pillsbury Doughboy. He's, he's kind of my role model sometimes, right? Um, so I like to bake things. I, you know, I like to cook all kinds of things. But when you bake, uh, particularly bread, yeast bread, Jesus used this illustration that sin is like yeast. And I can tell you, and some of you are cooks too, you know when you're making that yeast bread, you know, you put it in that, that yeast and warm water and you kind of let that culture develop and you add flour and then you start mixing it and kneading it into the dough. Now, once I have that done, I take it and I, I just warm the oven up a little bit and I put it in that dark oven and I put a, a cover over it and I just let it sit. I don't do anything to it and I just let it do its thing. And you know what that yeast does? It permeates. It just starts working its way. It starts affecting all the rest of the dough. And Jesus is like, this is exactly what sin in your life is like. When you, you, first of all, give it an environment to grow, a place to grow, when when you allow your heart to go unchecked by yourself or by by others in your life and you just let it go, it is going to grow and it's going to expand to the point where it encompasses every area of your life. Now, I was on my way into to the church this week and I was just kind of running this through my head and, and then it struck me in my times of, of cooking and I'm not, I'm not the best cook, but there were some things I was thinking about in terms of yeast. And I was like, wait a second. Do you know what kills yeast? You know, one of the things that will kill yeast? Like, bing, salt. Salt. And I was like, wow, salt. Salt, well, if you put too much in, it'll kill your yeast. If you put in just the right amount, it'll slow down the effect of yeast. Because, see, I, I like to make pizza. And so I make this pizza dough and I let it rise just for a short time. Then I add salt. And the salt is so that, you know, my pizza dough crust isn't like this big, you know. And, and so you put salt in there. And I was like, man, that, isn't that just a spiritual truth? Because Jesus says, you 
are the salt of the earth. And so, see, when we line our lives up with God, when we walk with God, we pursue God, when the very presence, the Spirit of God indwells us, and that is our focus, that is our intent. And you know what? We bring stuff forward. If there's sin in our life, we bring it to Him. We don't leave anything undone. And you know what? That yeast dies. That sin can't take hold. That sin can't grow. And that's what he's talking about here. We don't give sin an opportunity. Because I will tell you what, sin always, always, always escalates. It will always escalate in your life. It will always go farther than you think. Uh, In my years as a pastor, I have not known anyone whose life ran into the ditch and that was their intention from the beginning. Where they were like, you know, when I grow up, I want to be an addict. You, you don't hear those things. You don't see those things. Uh, they're not planned out. They just they happen little by little. Uh, I've done marriages in here. And anytime I do a marriage, you know, the husband's, uh, the groom is over here. And the bride's over here. And, and can you imagine? Can you imagine vows that are exchanged between them planning such destruction in their marriage? That he's standing here and he's like, um, Honey, you know, instead of the uh, I promise to love, honor, and cherish, uh, here's what I want you to know. In, in seven years, I'm going to be emotionally detached from you. And, and honey, I just want you to know, in seven years, I'm going to start up flirting with a coworker. And my plan is then to have an affair and to drop this bomb on my family. And, and my plan is then to just wreak havoc in our children's lives so that they even question their own value and their own self-worth, so that they can then carry that honey into their marriage for the next seven generations. Can you imagine that kind of vow? And she's over here, and she's like, well, honey, that's okay, because I just want you to know that in seven years, I plan on emasculating you daily. Right? I plan on tearing you down and chipping away at you because I'm going to know your weaknesses. And I'm going to know your frailties, hon. And you know what? Every chance I get, when you don't do what I want you to do, I'm going to throw it up in your face. And you know what? I'm going to torque and torment the very hearts of our children when they see me emasculate you so that they can carry that into their families and into their marriages for the next seven generations. I do. I mean, you know that that is, that's not a reality. No one starts out there. See, what you have to understand is, is how you get from point A to point B is just little by little. It's these tiny, tiny decisions. It's these tiny compromises that, you know what, okay, I, I can flirt here and I'm not hurting anybody. Uh, you know what, I can just take this pill and it's just going to take the edge off. I can just take this drink and you know what, it's going to calm my spirit. I can just go in this chat room because I'm bored and it's no big deal. And then what happens is, is that stuff gets a hold. There's a root that begins to grow and, and all of a sudden this life is in full destruction mode. And it impacts just not that individual, but the entire family. See, you have to recognize the dangers of practicing sin and letting it be master. I I, I know I've I've used this illustration before, but that show um, when animals attack and people are just dumbfounded. I don't know why, but they're always surprised that Well, he was such a cute little grizzly cub. He was so furry and cuddly. And I guess I never recognized that he grew to be 1,700 pounds and had fangs. 
And poor Uncle Joe, I don't know how he ripped him apart so fast before I could even get there. I mean, you know, in one sense, we're like, man, that's funny. But in the reality, this is what sin does, because sin just lures you in and you think, okay, it's not that big a deal. I can handle it. I can pet it. And you know what? It's not hurting anybody in my house. And all of a sudden, one day you wake up and this thing has fangs and it has teeth. And it brings with it destruction. And this is what sin does. This is what sin does. And, and you know, we're tempted to buy into the lie that somehow we are sin's master and we have it controlled. And what you don't know is that it has owned you completely. And it's your master. And, and as long as, as you are under it as its servant, you are just creeping closer and closer to being devoured by it. The only solution, church, the only solution to this, what Scripture gives us, is to drag that sin out into the light and you kill it. You beat it to death. You've got to recognize the spiritual battle that is a reality. You know, Paul makes it very clear. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities of darkness. And you've got to see that there is a spiritual battle. There is a war going on waged against you and your family. And you might think that this sin is harmless and it's not that big a deal. But the goal that the enemy has for you is to sow destruction into your family for like the next seven generations. See, God created our homes to be a place for flourishing, for growth. Parents, it's a place where we point to God all the time. Parents, it's a place where we talk with our kids about loving God and honoring God. And, and even if we mess up, we can tell them, you know, it's okay because God loves us and we can still go to Him. And, and it's supposed to be a place where we flourish, not a place... Or destruction. So sin is, is something that you take out into the light and you've got to kill it. I, I can't stress to you the seriousness of this. You have to be serious about it. You can't play around with it. You can't treat it with kid gloves. If you won't take it serious, know this. You have an enemy who takes it very seriously. He takes it very seriously. Maybe you play around, but he's not. He has one purpose, one goal for you, and that's to seek and devour you and your life. To seek, to kill, to destroy. He breathes it. He lives it. And he's been doing it from practically the very beginning. So he knows exactly what he's doing. So the best response, actually not the best, the only response is confession and repentance. That's what we do. We don't leave something undone. We just don't leave sin and say, you know, it's not that big a deal. I'm not going to worry about it. No, we bring it out into the light and, and we get with others and, and we confess that. We have others that surround us, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Church, you're not alone in this walk. This walk is not something we do. We're all susceptible. This is why uh, James says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. That is the only way to break that bondage, is to put it into light. And then you know what? We step into the light with it. We, we, we come with our brokenness, come with our fears and our doubts, all of our imperfections. And we have those people in our life that we can go to and say, this is me, this is who I am. And, and you know what? I promise you, there is not a person in this room that has an original sin. There's nothing that has got its hook into us that no one else, like you're the only one in history. So we got to take your picture and put you on the internet because it's like they're the only one in history to struggle with this. No. You know, the scripture is very clear that, that Satan goes around like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. And so we come, we come alongside one another and we build each other up. We encourage each other because we are all, all susceptible. And, and we want to encourage each other. Let, let me take you to um, the bright spot. 
of this passage, okay? Uh, look there in 17, because I don't want you to miss the good news of what Paul is saying here. Look at verse 17. I want you to pay attention to this. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin. Okay, I want you to understand that. You catch it? You were once slaves to sin. Right? You were that person that had sin leading to lawlessness that led to lawlessness and on and on. But that's not who you are anymore because of what Christ has done. Because of what Jesus does in our life. Now listen, sin is no longer our master. You do not have to obey sin when it calls. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Tommy Nelson, but... He made this comment he, talking about how sin calls to us, and I, I just liked it. He said, just because the phone rings don't mean you got to answer it. Put that in your mind. Just because the phone rings doesn't mean you have to answer it. See, you've been set free. When, when you came to Christ, He set you free from all that bondage of sin, that sin is your master. He, he set you free. He set you free, proclaimed you free, so that you're no longer bound to sin, and you don't have to give in to every desire that comes along. I want to read uh, verses 16 and 17 here. I'm going to read it out of the message. He says, All your lives you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master, one whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. See, church, the gospel, it changes us. It transforms us on so many levels. And this is what Paul's talking about. It's like you used to be enslaved to sin, but now Christ has set you free. That's no longer who you are. Church, do you recognize your identity? You're, you're not bound to that old sin nature. Before Christ, you had no choice. You had no choice. See, we're hardwired to serve. We're hardwired to serve something or someone. And so that's why Paul is using this analogy of slaves and masters. And he's wanting you to understand that before Christ, you had no choice. This was your master. But now Christ has set you free. And because he set you free, you're no longer obligated. You don't have to live that way. He transforms us. Look at Romans, uh, look at verses 17 and 18. I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation for you. He says, Thanks God, thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteousness. So what he's saying is, is you've heard about this teaching. Now, what is the teaching he's talking about? The gospel. You've heard the gospel. And what he's saying is, is that you heard the gospel and you responded to it. It actually took a hold in your heart and God did a work there. It's not some ethereal idea or concept just kind of vague out there. You experience that. You know transformation took place. When you chose to follow Christ, when we become a new creation, you don't have to sit and scratch your head and say, I wonder, did anything happen? Now, for some of us, you know, we notice like, boom, right away. Others, there's a progression. But whether you are like instantaneous and you know it, or you see a progression over time, you will know it. You will know it. You will know that, that He begins to change you. He's made this transformation in you. And, and because of what He's done, here's what He's saying, because of what He's done, where before you used to respond to sin because it was your master, now because Christ has set you free, it's out of a love for Him that we respond. And, and now we want to be slaves to righteousness. You get that? I mean, think about, do you just ever take time and just think about what God did for you? Did you ever just think about that? I would challenge you, just on your way to work or in the quietness of night, 
or morning, you know, you think about that. How he saved you. You didn't deserve it, but he did. And see, when we begin to dwell on that, then, then out of that flows this heart of gratitude and thanksgiving. And out of that heart flows worship because we recognize where we were then and where we are now. Not because of what we did, but because of what God did. And so it's out of that. Are you tracking with me? Because out of that, because of our love for him, now we respond, respond not because we're obligated, but because we want to. We want to live a life. God, you saved me. Let me live a life that honors you. Let me live a life that, that pleases you. Let my, heart, let my heart be focused on you. That's what Paul is talking about here. So the question comes back. Who then is your master? You, you can look at your own life. You can look at the fruit in your life. You can, you can evaluate your life. You can look and say, is my life such that, okay, do I stumble here and there? We all do. Do I have things in my life that are a practice that I know are wrong? And God's tried to, to deal with me on it, but I won't let it go. See, that, that when you're there, then you become a slave of sin. See, we only have two choices. We're either, a, we're either obedient to sin or we're obedient to God. We either um, surrender to sin or we surrender to the righteousness of God. Those are your only two options. And so, as I said, it was for freedom that Christ came to set us free. And listen, freedom's not a question of whether or not we would like to serve. It's the choice of which master we will serve. See, this is an area where I'm just telling you as disciples, as followers of Christ, it becomes very real in our life, the things we wrestle with. As believers, as disciples, if, if we allow sin to, to get a hold and to try to pull us down, and, and maybe that's where you're at, and, I, and, and my heart goes out, I, I, I've been there before, because you have an enemy who seeks to destroy you and will just beat you into the ground with it to the point where you feel helpless and hopeless. And he'll tell you, you have to resign to the fact. You have to resign yourself to the fact that this is just who you are. And you have to live with this. But let me tell you, he is a father of lies. Because that is not who God says you are. Not who he says you are. Christ came to set you free. And when you are free, you are free indeed. There's no depth that you can go to that the grace of God can't reach. Right? There's no sin in our life. Think about this. There's no sin in our life that is more powerful than the cross, than the blood that was shed on the cross. There's no sin greater than that. And, and I don't care how seemingly big or heavy or thick this chain, this weight is around your neck. It is the power of Christ that shatters it. With just a word. That's our God. That's our King. He recognizes. He sees when we hurt. When we struggle. And He does not walk away. He is the one that draws us back to Himself. So that He can break those chains. And remind you that you are no longer bound. Sin is no longer your master. You've been set free. And so maybe, maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you have actually never surrendered your heart and your life to Christ to begin with. And so you've never had that wonderful experience of what grace is. You've never known what that is when I talk about how when the gospel gets a hold of our heart, there is transformation. And, and I don't know, maybe you've come to church a lot. But you've never experienced that because there's never actually been a point where you had full heart surrender. And so for you, being a Christian is kind of a religious thing of do this and don't do that. And you are completely missing out on life and the fullness of life in Christ. 
Maybe that's where you are. And this is a day where God's grace just flows to the surface in your life because God brings you here to hear truth and says, you need to surrender to me. I mean, he wraps us up very neatly in verse 23, Paul does, at the end of this section. He makes it very clear for us. When he's talking about the different masters, he lays out the contrast. For the wages of sin is death. You serve sin as a master, this is the wage that you earn at the end of the day. This is your severance check, and it's death. But the free gift of God, he says, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, sin leads to death. When sin is our master, it's death. When we choose God, and this is what I love, God recognizes that you and I have no possible way of our own getting out from under that master's hold of sin and death. We can't get out from it. We're stuck. Unless we confess and surrender to Christ and put our faith and trust in Him. And then at that point, boom, we are set free. This is what Paul's talking about. That if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, all things become new. It's like, boom, there is new life, new freedom. And it's only found in Christ and Christ alone. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up as I close here and... You know, this, this area up here is a place of, of prayer. It's a place of worship. It's a place of surrender for life markers. And I just offer that to you. You know, if God, if the Holy Spirit is at work in your life because there's an area or areas that you've not surrendered and maybe you're under the uh, delusion that you have a handle on it, I'm just telling you now you need to wake up. Scripture says that sin blinds. And somehow we can't see what destructive force it is in our life and, in our, and how it affects our family. I'm just saying this is the place. This is the time. Would you stand with me and let me close us in prayer? Father God, as we close our time together, I thank you that you are a God of love, of compassion, of grace, of mercy. Just the fact that we are gathered here, the fact that you have laid this out for us, with clarity in Scripture. We thank you for that. Now, Father, I pray for uh, the hearts here, that we would have hearts that respond to you, that if there's an area where we need to surrender, that we would act upon that. If there's an area that we need to confess and repent, that we would act upon that. That, that if we have never made that decision to know you, that, that we would cry out this day and say, Lord, I want to know you. If your heart here echoes that, just come let us pray with you. Come let us share with you. Don't lose an opportunity to respond. We pray these things, Father, in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.